So as a thoughtful Christian meditates on this psalm, Psalm 94, it is hard to escape the conclusion that a good name for it would be a psalm for the secular West or, or a psalm for 2018. But this would be a mistake. While it is absolutely pertinent for our time, there have been many generations when the same things could be said, including the time when it was written. God has always been holy, and man has always been sinful, and so the math always seems to work out the same way. God is everlastingly holy, man is inventively and creatively sinful, but being finite, those sinful grooves that he cuts for himself have to follow a set number of patterns. And one of the patterns they follow is the pattern that's set out in this psalm. It was uh, true centuries before Christ, and it is true in our time, true in our day. So let's walk through the psalm and consider what it says verse by verse. The first is a plea for Jehovah to show himself. Yahweh, rise up. Jehovah, show yourself. You are the one that owns vengeance. As it says in Romans, uh, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God is the possessor of vengeance. He stakes an ownership claim to vengeance. Vengeance is the, something that belongs to God, verse 1. And so we turn to God, asking him to deal with these sorts of things that need to be dealt with. God, please rouse yourself. Hammer the proud, verse 2. God, rouse yourself. Do something about this. God, don't you see what I see on the evening news? Don't you see what I see happening? Don't you see unfolding what I see unfolding? And we know, academically, we know theologically that God is omniscient. He knows all of it exhaustively. Um, and so we find it inexplicable that he would be just biding his time. He's uh, waiting for some reason. And so we don't want him to wait. We ask him to, God, stir yourself up. How long are you going to let the wicked run on like this? Verse 3. How, there, and there's two things. One, we shouldn't be surprised when God is waiting. God waits until he sees the whites of their eyes, to take that famous phrase. God's waiting, letting them run on, letting them run on. And we're saying, God, <laughs> it's now. Now is the time to deal with this. God says, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. So there's two things. One, we should learn from this psalm that God is often going to wait a little bit longer than we want him to. Secondly, we learn from the psalmist that it's all right to be impatient with him in this way. We ought to be impatient with him in this way. God gives us this psalm and many others like it where we are instructed to pray this psalm. We're instructed to sing this psalm. And when we sing it, we should feel it the way the psalmist felt it. God, what's the deal? Why are they just allowed to talk that way? Why are they allowed to just do these things? How long will they be allowed to boast in their pufferies? Verse 4. God, do you not see that they are breaking your people? Verse 5. Don't you see that they come after, after your people? They murder widows, aliens, and orphans. Verse 6. And they give themselves a free pass in all of this by saying that, that God does not see it. God does not see what we are doing. We're going to do it to the widow. God does not see we're going to do it to the stranger in the land. God does not see we're going to do it to the orphan. We are going to dismember children in the womb by the tens of millions, and we're going to do it with the impudent belief, in the impudent belief that God in heaven does not see. So then, understand, you swinish men, as it, verse 8, you brutish men, you besotted men, you swinish men. Learn wisdom, you fools, verse 8. Do you really think, do you honestly think that the one who made the ear cannot hear? That the one who fashioned the exquisite mechanism of the eye is himself blind? Verse 9. The one who chastises pagan nations, shall he not correct you? You're part of the covenant people of God. Why would he not correct you when he corrects pagan nations? Verse 10. He that teaches knowledge to men, and then uh, words that at that point fail the psalmist. If you, if you have a King James in, in verse 10, it says, He that teacheth man knowledge shall not he know is in italics. What that means is it's not in the original. All right. So basically, uh, the psalmist gets to that point and says, he, uh, in verse 10, he that teacheth man knowledge, dot, dot, dot. Oh, never mind, right? Oh, never mind. The words fail me. I don't, 
can't you see that the one who made the eye is not blind? The one who made the ear is not deaf. The one who teaches pagan nations, he's, he's certainly able to teach you. The one who gives all knowledge, the, all knowledge, the one who's the source of all knowledge, do you honestly think that you know more than he does? Oh, you know, stop it. Just stop. So, words fail the psalmist in verse 10. God knows the thoughts of a man, verse 11. They are three parts mist and two parts smoke. That's, the, that's how substantial the thought of man is over against the thought of God. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are far deeper than our thoughts. We, he, he, is, he transcends us all. We think that we are so wise and we are vanity. Nothing but vanity. In the first verses of the psalm, in the first, uh, oh, seven uh, first seven verses. In the first seven verses, we see how the wicked conduct themselves. This is how the, the wicked set up shop. Then there's an apostrophe where the psalmist turns at, to, to them and speaks to them, amazed at how thick they are. And then there's a turn at verse 12. Blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth, O Lord, and teacheth him out of thy law. So the wicked run on, ver, verses 1 through 7, he speaks to them, are you, are you really that clueless? And then the hope begins, the hope begins to be articulated in verse 12. God intervenes on behalf of his blessed ones, and we see that his saints are privileged to join in the battle. So when at the, it begins with us asking God to, God, rise up, why don't you engage with your enemies? Why don't you... Um, do something about these enemies of yours. Why don't you rise up and deal with them? Vengeance belongs to you. And then verse 16, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Right? Bless the Lord had been my help, verse 17. All of a sudden, the psalmist is in the fight. The psalmist has now been privileged to do something, to be used by God in this battle. So, if God teaches and chastises a man, that man is blessed that man is blessed. If, if God interferes with you, God is being merciful to you. In Romans 1, what is, how is the wrath of God described? The wrath of God in Romans 1 is described, therefore the wrath of God is visited from heaven on all the unrighteousness of men. So how is it described? Therefore God gave them up. The wrath of God is God letting go of the reins. The wrath of God is God taking his foot off the brake pedal. That's the wrath of God. The wrath of God is God saying, very well then, do it your way. Do it your way, America. Slaughter one another. Do it your way, America. Men marry men. Do it your way. And, and when he takes off his restraining mercy, we run headlong. That's what happens. That's the wrath of God. The wrath of God means that God is in the process of abandonment. And when we are abandoned by him, we do nothing other than destroy ourselves. When God intervenes, when God chastens, when God ruffles your feathers, when God rebukes you, when God admonishes you, uh, what does it say in Hebrews 12? Don't be discouraged at this. God is treating you as a son. God is treating you as a daughter if God is dealing with you. So if God teaches and chastens a man, then that man is blessed. There's nothing worse than being left alone by God. Nothing worse than being left to your own devices by God. The short one-word summary of that is hell. The two-word summary of that is, the outer, is outer darkness. When God lets you be, when God lets you run, when God lets you have it your way, that is damnation. God will give him rest from affliction until the point when the wicked get theirs. God's going to relieve the righteous, verse 13. God will never forsake his own heritage, Verse 14, now God will sometimes make his own heritage more than a little nervous. As you've heard me say before, God loves cliffhangers. God loves to take his people right up to the banks of the Red Sea. The water is lapping at their feet. They turn around. They see Pharaoh's armies coming after them. This is a tight spot. God does this over and over. God, it's proverbial among the, the Jews, going back to Genesis, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Abraham has his son Isaac tied to the altar and, and his knife hand is up in the air and then God intervenes. Why didn't God intervene at the base of the mountain? Surely he had enough to go on. 
I surely had enough to go on. No, God wanted to take Abraham right up to the edge. He wanted to take Moses right up to the edge. He wants us to know that God, God has not abandoned us simply because he puts us in positions where we must trust him. We must trust him to not abandon us. And what, how does he get us to trust him to not abandon us? Well, by putting us in situations where it looks like he might. Right? That, that's how it works. God puts us in situations where it looks like he might abandon us as, as we look at the circumstances, but we know from his word that he does not abandon his own heritage. The upright will follow a right judgment, verse 15. Who will stand on our behalf against the wicked, verse 16. The Lord is the only one who could do that, verse 17. When our foot is about to slip, and that's because God has, has us standing in what looks to us like a slippery place, right? When it looks like to, uh, to, to us like we're about to slip, the mercy of God intervenes at that point. God is a firm believer in just-in-time delivery, right? That's what he does. He just comes at the right moment. When it looks like I'm going to slip, the mercy of God intervenes, verse 18. When our thoughts are buzzing like a hive full of irritated bees, the comforts of God do what? Verse 19, the comforts of God delight us. When our thoughts are in turmoil, God intervenes at that point to give a peace that passes all understanding, as Paul says in Philippians. When There are times when in the middle of afflictions or in the middle of battle, you might say, well, that doesn't apply to this, this church. I've read about, but I have read about these things in books. I've, I've read that some Christians go through afflictions. That was 300 years ago. No, every one of you goes through afflictions. Every one of you goes through troubles. Every one of you goes through trials. In the middle of afflictions, in the middle of battle, your thoughts can be like the branches of a tree in a gale. All right, you know how that is. The branches of the tree are, the, the trunk is sitting there. The tree is not, not going anywhere, but the branches don't, don't appear to know that. The branches are waving all around in a crazy kind of way. Sometimes the branches get tangled. The high winds cause your thoughts to move first here and then there. Sometimes they get tangled the way branches can. It is there in that moment when the comforts of God delight you. That's the moment when the comforts of God delight you. Let me read verse 19 again. In the multitude of my thoughts, in the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Multitudes of thoughts generally are, multi are the kind of thoughts you have when you're in trouble, right? You generally, when, when you're delighted, when you're just naturally delighted, when you got a great present, when something wonderful happened, you've got one thought, which is gratitude about this one thing. It's when you're in trouble that you have all these thoughts. And it's at that point that God delights your soul. Ask God to delight your soul in the multitude of your thoughts. So then, God deals with his people lovingly. He delights in his people, and he, he teaches us to delight in him. Now, the psalmist then turns to the next point. Shall the throne of iniquity, that which uses laws as instruments of mischief, but enough about the United States Congress, have fellowship, can that throne have fellowship with God? Can that throne have fellowship with God? The implied answer is no. Verse 20, and what is the consequence of God refusing fellowship to a throne? When God does not fellowship with the established authority, what is happening to that authority? It's in the process of eroding. It's in the process of coming to pieces. If God does not establish a throne, that throne cannot remain. That throne must fall. But in the meantime, they, they don't think that way. They're arrogant, they're conceited, they're proud, they're stuck up. And so what do they do? They gather, they assemble, they conspire, and they do so against innocent blood. Verse 21. They conspire against innocent blood. And why do they conspire against innocent blood? There is no heaven above us, no hell below us. You just imagine, it's easy if you try. Above Buchenwald, no heaven, no justice, no God. Above every Planned Parenthood clinic in the country, there is no justice. There is no God who sees. That's what they say. There is no God who sees. So we can just continue to do this with impunity. 
Nevertheless, God remains our defense and our rock of refuge. Verse 22, there's a final holy warning given, no less ominous for its holiness. I think all the more ominous for its holiness. God will, God will bend their iniquity back onto them. Verse 23, he will cut them off in their wickedness. He will absolutely cut them off. So, this is a psalm of judgment. It is a psalm of imprecation. An imprecatory psalm is a psalm where the psalmist is asking God to intervene and to deal with the wicked. Asking God to come down and smite them. Smite the wicked. So, how are we as Christians? We're, we're told, aren't we, to love our enemies. We're told that we're supposed to pray for those who persecute us. We're told that we're supposed to turn the other cheek. If you're struck on one cheek, turn the other. How are we to reconcile this old covenant business, you know, calling down fire and wrath and judgment in the Psalms, with the, New, with the New Testament teaching to love your enemies? And then couple it with the fact that New Testament Christians are told to sing Psalm 94. All right, so address one another, and it says in Ephesians, with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Same thing is said to the Colossians, address one another, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I'm supposed to be preaching through the psalms. I'm supposed to preach through the scriptures. All scriptures God breathed, Paul says. Speaking of the Old Testament, all scriptures God breathed and is profitable. All of it is profitable. So how can we sing it? How can we memorize it? How can we read it? How can we study it and yet reconcile it with the command that we all know that Christians are supposed to love their enemies. As Christians, we're instructed to sing the Psalms, all of them. Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16. This means that God wants these Psalms, all of the Psalms, including this one, to help shape our devotional lives. And this includes the imprecatory Psalms. The imprecatory Psalms are not put off the table. He, we're not told to sing all of them except for the following. We're, we're supposed to sing psalms. James says, is, is anyone among you merry? Let him sing psalms. Let him sing psalms. God wants us to have a piety that knows how to cry out for vengeance. God wants us to have a piety that knows how to cry out for vengeance. A piety that calls for blood. It is not contrary to the new covenant to ask the God of heaven to deal with what's going on. The saints of the new covenant, the martyred saints in the book of Revelation, the saints under the altar are crying out to God, what? The same thing that, they, that the psalmist is doing here. How long, O oh Lord, is judgment going to be withheld? God, aren't you going to intervene? Aren't you going to come down and deal with this place? Aren't you going to smash some things? When are you going to, when are you going to smash some things? You say, well, that's not, that doesn't seem to be very New Covenant-like. Doesn't seem very Christ-like. What did Jesus say? The disciples are rubbernecking their way through Jerusalem, looking at the temple, and the, gold, the, the temple was plated with gold, and they're looking around. And Jesus said, do you see all this? He said, not one stone is going to be left standing on another. And this generation is not going to pass away until everything is fulfilled. Not one stone. This place is going to be flattened. And the disciples said, who will do this, O Lord? And Jesus said, an Old Testament God some, from somewhere in Isaiah. <laughs> no. who, who, does, who flattened Jerusalem? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus ascended into the heavenly places. He was given universal dominion. He was seated at the right hand of God the Father. And his first judicial act was that of flattening Jerusalem. He, he knew it was going to be flattened because he was going to be the one who did it. Now, he suffered for the sins of his people. He allowed himself to be tormented by them. He allowed himself to be crucified by them. He really was sacrificial. But this does not displace the judgment, old school judgment, uh, ju old school judgments, you might say, like Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction of Egypt, and all, that that doesn't go away. We need to uh, we need to put it all together in a larger picture. It doesn't one thing doesn't displace the other. So we need to learn how to pray like the, the martyrs under the altar. How to pray like the the martyrs under the altar. Lord, when are you going to do something? However. 
there's an important qualification. If you find yourself singing psalms of imprecation because someone cuts you off in traffic, then I would suggest that perhaps you're doing it wrong. If you utter curses from the Psalter because you open the fridge and find that someone finished off the ice cream, then perhaps a basic refresher is in order. Remember that Jesus rebuked some of his disciples who wanted to call down fire from heaven in Luke 9.55. They wanted to call fire down from heaven. Why? Well, because they were traveling to Jerusalem, which meant they were Jews. They were going there for uh, religious purposes, and the Samaritans didn't like the Jews. Jews didn't like the Samaritans. The Samaritans saw where they were going, and so the Samaritans said that the Motel 6 w had no vacancies when it did have vacancies. That was why the disciples were upset. Elijah had done this. Remember that Elijah, th uh, well, two times and possibly a third, called down fire from heaven to consume you and your 50. A, a, a captain comes out and and he says, if I'm a prophet of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. That happened once. That ha happened a second time. And then the captain of the third 50 was a lot more polite than the, um, the captains of the first 250. And he said he, he was much more deferential. But Elijah had done this in a showdown with the wicked king Ahaziah. That, that accounts in 2 Kings 1.10. So you really do have a biblical account of fire coming down from heaven and destroying evildoers. All right, and the same thing happened to the whole city of Sodom. You had the, the angels went down to Sodom, and, and it was destroyed with fire and brimstone. So James and John wanted to do this because some Samaritans had told them that Motel 6 was full when it wasn't. Now, they weren't reading the circumstance right. They weren't reading the, the, the setup right. They weren't reading the story right. Now, there's a simplistic kind of believer that wants one size to fit all everything. They get, they get the second king's one thing down, and they say, okay, fire from heaven, got it. If someone's opposing God for any reason, under any circumstance, do you want fire to come, God, do you want fire to come down from heaven and destroy them? Jesus rebuked the disciples, and he said, well, he said, you do not know what spirit you are of. You do not know what spirit you are of. You can call down fire from heaven in the name of Jehovah and actually be revealing that you're serving your father, the devil. Right, you can have, your, you can have the, the spirit of the thing all wrong. So, when we have learned to treat our personal enemies the way David did, 1 Samuel 24, 1 through 15, then we are in a good place to begin learning how to sing the way he did about God's enemies, Psalm 139, 21. The heart of the lesson is that psalms of imprecation are instances of us turning the whole thing over to God because he's the one to whom vengeance belongs. That's the first verse of our psalm. God is the owner of vengeance. Turn it over to him. So when it says in Romans 13, vengeance is mine, I will, I will repay, or at the end of Romans 12 and, and chapter 13, vengeance is mine, I will repay, we are not told, God does not say to us, vengeance is wrong, let no one repay. He does not say, vengeance is wrong, let no one repay. He says, vengeance is mine. Leave room for what God's going to do. Step back and turn it over to him. And a psalm of imprecation is that action of turning it over. Right, that's what you're doing is you're acknowledging, I am not the king of vengeance. I am not the queen of vengeance. I am not the, sh the sheriff of vengeance. It is not mine to do. Now, God, again in Romans 13, deputizes some people. He deputizes the magistrate to be his agent of wrath. There, it's possible for God to use human instruments to bring this about, but not human instruments that are full of the wrath of man. The anger of man, James says, the anger of man does not fulfill God's righteousness. So what, how, did, how did David? David is, um, knows how to pray a vivid curse. David knows how to do it. And we have records of that in the Psalms. But also, David was particularly magnanimous when it came to his own personal enemies. Who had done more wrong to David than King Saul? Who had done more? And then King Saul is just put within his grasp. And then David cuts off a corner of his of robe. The King Saul came into the cave where David was hiding. David cuts off a corner of his robe. Saul goes away. David follows him out and holds up the robe and says, see, I could have killed you right now. And David's conscience smote him about that. 
David's conscience bothered him about cutting Saul's robe. All right? Now, what was David's attitude toward his personal enemies? The irritating foe who cuts you off in traffic, the, the, uh, the malefactor who took all the rest of the ice cream, th those sorts of things, but also people who, are do who really do wrong to you, someone at work who's persecuting you. If you, don't want, if you don't want God to forgive that person, then you're praying it wrong. All right? Now, you're, this is what a, a, a basic prayer of imprecation does. God, destroy your enemies. Destroy your enemies. But there are two ways to destroy an en enemy. One is to destroy him. The other is to make him into a friend. All right, if someone had prayed for Saul of Tarsus and said of Saul of Tarsus as he was heading off to Damascus, there goes that evil man who is persecuting the church, who is casting his vote against Christians, who is responsible for some women being widows, right? And someone with the IFA said, I think God wants that man to write the majority of the New Testament. God, destroy that man. Did God answer that prayer? Yes, God answered that prayer. He destroyed that man. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. What, what happened to Saul of Tarsus? He was destroyed. Now, God can destroy someone in, in a way that's old school. He destroys them, and the, the fi their final destination is the outer darkness. Or he can destroy him, and it's a death and a resurrection. But the person, the, the enemy is destroyed in both instances. If you don't want, and if you don't want the person to be destroyed, if you were the, the widow who lost her husband because of Saul of Tarsus, and you said, I, I, don't, wa I don't want that, their conversion. I don't want repentance. Right? If you're playing the part of Jonah, in other words, Jonah didn't flee. When Jonah refused to preach to Nineveh, it wasn't because he was afraid. It wasn't because he was uh, concerned for his own safety. It was because he was afraid that if he went and preached repentance to Nineveh, God was going to grant repentance to Nineveh, and then they would repent, and then God would forgive them, and the hitch was that Jonah hated Nineveh. He hated the Assyrian Empire. And then when God does this, when Jonah preaches and the Ninevites repent, jo what is Jonah's reaction? It was, see, I knew you were going to do this. God, I, know, I, I knew that you were going to intervene mercifully for the Ninevites, and you, you didn't, God, take into account the fact that I hate them. Right? I hate them. And if you hate someone, and you are Jonah, and they're Nineveh, and, and, and trust me, Nineveh was really, really bad. Whoever it is that you're hating right now, probably not as bad as the Ninevites. Jonah had cause, right? Humanly speaking, Jonah had cause. Jonah knew God was merciful. He's full of love and kindness. If you don't want God to destroy a, a particular personal enemy of yours by trans, uh, transferring them into the kingdom of light, forgiving all their sins, putting them on their feet again, if you don't want that, then you're not praying imprecatory prayers the right way. So learning to pray the imprecatory prayers is a high necessity. The events of the last few months indicate that they've been prayed far too infrequently with regard to the wickedness of our national life. Christians need to be praying imprecatory psalms more often than they do. Getting your personal peeves and your own ego out of consideration does not turn you into a spiritual pacifist. Rather, it makes you into a reliable warrior. And never forget the high logic of all imprecation is found in the cross. The high logic of all imprecation is found in the cross. There we see the wickedness of man. There we see the hatred of God for sin. There we see the love of God for sinners. When curses rain down, now that Christ has come, that is how they ran, that is the center, central place where they strike. Now that Christ has come, how do the curses of God rain down? Mostly, they rain down on the, in the cross. So, when rebels are destroyed outside of Christ, destroyed in the old school fashion of Sodom, or of Egypt, or the antediluvian world, they are destroyed because they refused the wrath that transforms enemies into friends. They were offered the gospel, they refused the wrath of the cross, 
right? What we're doing when we preach the cross, we're coming to non-believers and saying, will you accept the wrath of God on sin? They refuse the wrath of God on sin as offered in the cross. They refuse the wrath that turns enemies into friends and thereby embrace the wrath that turns men and women into wraiths. So how does this, how do we put these things together? Well, remember one of the premises that non-believers need to deny. I'm going to appear to be changing the subject for just a minute, but I'm not changing it at all. The impudence of the theory of evolution, the impudence of the false religion of evolution, is seen in the fact that it denies the first premise that is set out here by the psalmist. Why are we speaking about evolution all of a sudden? When sinners pursue their sin, they do not want a holy God close to them. They want to put him at a great distance or remove him from consideration altogether. The argument of the psalmist is that God who made the eye can certainly see you. The evolutionist says, very well then, we will deny that God made the eye. Right? The argument is, the one who made the eye, can he not see you? The evolutionist says, well, eyes just happened. That's, they just happened. But the argument remains nevertheless. He that made the ear, does he not hear? He that formed the eye, does he not see? He that gives man knowledge, is he? And then the psalmist, like I said, is out of patience. Just stop. The point of evolutionary science is in no way the pursuit of knowledge. It is rather a pell-mell flight from the knowledge of God. The, promise, the, the problem that we have is not that we have too much knowledge. The, the pro, excuse me, the problem is not, not, not enough knowledge. The problem is that we have so much knowledge, much more that we want, and we're trying to offload some of it. We're trying to get rid of some of the knowledge that we have. It's too discomforting. So then, when we reject, when we, when we reject this, uh, the role that God has in our lives, that of being our creator, the one who made our eyes can, and can see us, the one who made our ears and can hear us, the one who gave us all our knowledge and knows what we're up to, all of that. When we pretend that God is not that way, the first thing, when we, when we pretend there is no God, the first thing that we see, unregenerate man sees, is a job opening. There is no God, therefore, job opening. Therefore, someone needs to become God. Therefore, someone needs to run. The, there is no predestining God. There is no sovereign God over all things. I think I'd like to be in that position. There's a vacancy there. We need a God who sees us, but not in a bad light, not the way the God of the Bible sees us. We need a God that can have what he sees be controlled in some manner by us. And because the Most High apparently cannot see us, for we have denied him, we will appoint some rebels to rule in his place. We will appoint rebels to rule in his place. They abuse that position, naturally, but it is better than having the living God run our lives or try to run our lives. So what do these jitney replacement gods do? They vaunt themselves in their pride, verses 2 and 4. They break God's people, verse 5. They attack the defenseless, verse 6. They think their great vain thinks, verse 11. They frame mischief through their legislation, verse 20. And their own iniquity rises up like scalding water out of a geyser and crashes back down upon them, verse 23. We must never forget that God is just. God is inexorably just, and God is infinitely powerful. He is a holy God. That means no sin ever committed in the history of the cosmos is going to go unaddressed. Nothing goes unaddressed. It is either addressed in the cross, where Jesus Christ paid it all, or the person who refuses the cross is going to be left to settle up accounts on his own. And because he cannot settle up accounts on his own, the end of that is outer darkness. The end of that is the lake of fire. The end of that is unremitting, everlasting, eternal wrath from God. Why? Because the person would not turn to God. It seems only fitting to conclude, I think, with the words of Johnny Cash, who expressed one of the central sentiments in this psalm very nicely. In his great song, uh, God's going to cut you down. Go tell that long-tongued liar. 
Go tell that midnight rider, tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter, tell him that God's going to cut him down. Tell him that God's going to cut him down. God is inexorably holy and just, righteous, and good. There is, there is going to be nothing left over. After, after everything is settled and done, n- there's no remainder. No remainder. Everything is addressed. Everything is in its place. Every sin is either paid for in Christ or it is being consumed in the outer darkness. Nothing is, nothing is overlooked. So never forget that the only safe way to flee from the wrath of God is to turn around and flee toward it. You can only flee from the wrath of God by turning on your heel and running toward the anger of his hot displeasure. Turn on your heel and run as fast as you can toward the wrath of God as it was poured out on the crucified Jesus. That is the wrath of God. We are so accustomed as Christians to think about the cross, Jesus died for sinners, means that's the love of God. Well, it's two things. It's the love of God for sinners, yes, but it is the hatred of God. You have never seen a better expression, a more vivid expression of God's hatred than the cross of Jesus Christ. God hates sin so much. God hates our pettiness. God hates our vindictiveness. God hates our marital bickering. God hates our selfishness. God hates our greed. God hates our lusts. God hates all of those things so much that when those things that you and I have committed, when those things were placed on his beloved son, God destroyed his son because he hates those things so much. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus have to cry out, why have you forsaken me? Because God took your sin, God made him who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So the sinless one becomes the sinful one, full of sin, not his own. He never sinned. It was, he was still praying to God, my God, my God. He was, he was uh, uh, quoting scripture, Psalm 22. He was not sinning at all. He was trusting in God. He was crying out to the God who have, had, he, he felt had abandoned him, but Christ remained faithful. Christ remained faithful. He never sinned. He never was a sinner. But the one who was never a sinner became sinful, full of sin. The sin that you've committed and I've committed was placed on him, and God demonstrated his white, hot hatred of that sin by destroying his son, by putting his son to the extremity of death. Every sinner dies. Every sinner has to be cut down. Either it will happen in Christ with the prospect of resurrection and everlasting life before you, or it will happen to you while you are standing before God, naked and ashamed, with the skies and seas and lands, having all fled from you in humiliated embarrassment. Nothing to present to God but your own vile sins and no Christ to bear them. That's the one alternative. Nothing to present to God but your sins and no Christ. Because why, why no Christ? Because you wouldn't have him. He was, present, he was preached to you. He was offered to you. But you said no, no, no. And so one day, that person is going to come before God with nothing but his sins, hands full of sin, and no Christ. Or, for the redeemed, they have nothing but their sins to contribute. But through the gospel, they are privileged to say the name of Christ, who then presents them faultless to, to his Father. Those are the only, the only two alternatives, full of fault, full of sin, full of vileness, all by yourself, or in the name of Jesus, presented in the righteousness of Jesus, faultless to the Father. Remember the, the conclusion of the, the text I cited in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, either completely devastated in your sin, completely corrupted in your sin, and that's all you have is corruption, or you can come in Christ and all you have is righteousness. All you have is perfection. You're not going to stand in that great day unless you stand there perfect, and you're not going to be able to stand there perfect unless Christ is your righteousness. Our Father and God, we thank you for your kindness to us. Father, I pray that as we meditate on these things, you would 
show your mercy to us by giving, opening the eyes of our hearts so that we can see and understand and grasp what you've done for us. Father, as we... This is not a sad meal. This is a victory feast. This is the sign of our ransom, the tokens of our redemption, the proof that we have been set free, evidence that Christ has won and his righteousness will be revealed to the ends of the earth. This is our weekly Thanksgiving meal, what the older church called the Eucharist. Our Jesus is not dead. He is not suffering anymore. He suffered once for all our sins, and having suffered, bled and died, he satisfied the exact terms of our justice. His blood paid the wages of all our sin, and having accomplished this, he rose up victorious over sin, death, and the devil, and is alive forever, and sat down at the right hand of the Father where he reigns forever, putting every enemy beneath his feet, putting everything right. We celebrate this meal not imagining Jesus still on the cross. We celebrate this meal with Jesus crowned in glory in heaven. And therefore, we do not celebrate this meal with any uncertainty about how the story will turn out. We do not pretend that we do not know. We celebrate this meal precisely because we do know. We know the rest of the story. Jesus is risen from the dead. He is seated in heaven as the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. We know how this story goes. So in the face of all cultural and political turmoil, in the face of millions of babies slaughtered, in the face of justice miscarried, in the face of defiant sexual deviance, in the face of hardship, uncertainty, sickness, loneliness, and even in the face of death itself, we give our thanks here and we share this bread and wine, proclaiming the death of our king by which he purchased our salvation and inherited the ends of the earth for his possession. These are the tokens of his victory, the signs and seals of our redemption, and the absolute certainty of his justice filling this world. We do not yet see all things put beneath his feet, but we do see Jesus, and in him we see all things put right. This is our victory, even our faith. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks, so let's pray. Our God and Father, we praise you and we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine that you've given to us to proclaim to us and to our children forever that Jesus is one. We give you thanks now in his name and amen. amen. If you know Jesus, if you know Jesus, then you know what Jesus does with his enemies because once you were an enemy of Jesus and you know that he can be trusted, it makes no sense. We were enemies and he came and he destroyed us. He destroyed us in Jesus and he raised us up to good life, to the new life, to eternal life. So he can be trusted. And it's only in that place, recognizing that Jesus always gets his enemies, he always destroys his enemies, he always does justice. It's only in that place, in the peace of that place, that you are useful in this fight. So receive God's blessing now and go with his peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and amen.